I uh, think uh, there are two uh, types of scientists here, perhaps, you know, one that does the really interesting things and uh, under try to understand the brain and manipulate the brain, and the second one is uh, creates technologies that enables this. And I'm on the second uh, set of scientists uh, that are basically engineers that uh, en uh, develops technology to enable uh, the scientists to do their, their work. So uh, we got uh, into uh, brain-computer interfaces about uh, five years ago with uh, a grant from National Science Foundation, teamed up with the uh, University of Washington and uh, MIT to develop uh, technology for wireless implantable bidirectional brain computer interfaces. So we did not start with, uh, you know, with uh, bidirectional brain computer interfaces or uh, spinal cord stimulation or cortical stimulation, but eventually we morphed into, into this area. So the idea is whether, uh, as our keynote speaker addressed, whether we can have devices uh, outside the body extended you know, and uh, uh, the functionality of the, of the brain to use the devices that are external. You know, that's a um, uh, car example is one of them. It could be a prosthetic limb, it could be other devices. We can go for one step further and uh, perhaps use the, re enable the extremities that we lost control of due to stroke or uh, some other disease uh, by stimulating the brain and use uh, either the cortical uh, plasticity or uh, spinal cord plasticity. So this is, this is what we started with. We basically are looking at a system uh, which uh, can uh, record the signals from the brain. Um, I was, okay. I record the signals from the brain, you know, like amplifies it, uh, does some detection, and then mm, applies some treatment. Uh, ultimately, this could be an autonomous system that basically makes uh, certain decisions based on uh, the recordings that, that takes place. Uh, the uh, generic system uh, view would be electrodes that are implanted in the brain, whether these are outside the brain, using EEG, they are on the brain, on the epidermal surface, you know, using ECOG, or they could be intracortical electrodes that are recording deep into the brain. And uh, the data that is uh, recorded would be, uh, would be analyzed for certain features, whatever the features that we're looking at, and eventually could be turned into commands that controls external devices. These external devices could be wheelchairs, uh, computer games, uh, this would be an interesting area, uh, limb controls, and other things. So the question here is, could the control brain learn to produce control signals for controlling something that is not part of the body? Or we can make it a little bit more interesting, could the brain relearn to control the parts of the body that it did lose the control for one reason or another? So we wanted to develop technologies that enable basically this vision. That's uh, what we came up with originally. The, uh, we decided to develop um, a set of sensors and actuators that are wirelessly connected and that can record from the muscles or from the brain uh, and turn this into uh, command and control for external devices. So we came up with uh, fairly small devices. Actually, these devices are, this is a 16-channel EEG device that we are still, uh, still using for certain tests. Uh, this is an eight-channel differential EMG device that is uh, uh, for recording from the muscles. Uh, it's a 32-channel implantable BCI uh, with uh, ultrasonic power harvesting that we developed. And uh, we, we bundled all of them around a wireless body area network so we can basically generate signals that are correlated from different parts of the body and eventually turn this into into some command and control for an external device. Now this is, uh, when we designed this system, we decided that we want to develop a system which will basically be extendable to other sensors and actuators so that uh, we can uh, easily uh, reproduce uh, the, uh, or reuse the components that we develop. This is, as an engineer, this would be, you know, something that I would want. Eventually, the system that we came up with was this little system, which basically is less than a centimeter wide, and it was two centimeters, I think, uh, in size. 
that had uh, 16 channels of uh, EEG, eight channels of EMG, uh, wireless to communicate with external, external devices. Now, but nevertheless, this system did not have any stimulation capability or did not have the uh, ultrasonic uh, charger uh, capability. So when our research shifted a little bit, and we decided that, okay, you know, like, uh, now we have a system which can basically record from the muscles, which can record the EEG signals, the intention, the concentration levels, and uh, we can control simple things by uh, designing, by basically measuring the level of concentration, uh, design games around it, and our students are hacking these systems to basically do such things. Uh, can we do uh, something a bit further? Can we actually design a system which will allow us to uh, regenerate the broken links in the brain and uh, stimulate the brain based on um, spikes or activity that we detected in other parts of the brain. And that's what we started to shift our research into. So in our current system, we basically record the brain signals. Again, you know, this is no different. Uh, decode the brain state, encode, and decide about the stimulation and stimulate the electronics to generate signals for the, uh, uh, for the brain or for the uh, spinal cord. Now, this is basically, you know, like, uh, the whole idea is to do direct measurements from the brain, and uh, we want to generate uh, signals for intentional control rather than random control, whether you concentrated or not, how much you concentrated, we should be able to generate intentional control and real-time processing, that is a critical factor. So that is uh, uh, where the system is basically uh, morphing. You know, like uh, we have the same system one more time, except we've added the wireless connectivity so we can uh, stimulate the brain, uh, record from the brain, and get the data out to control external devices. That is uh, our current system architecture where we can record the, the uh, system, the uh, recordings, of, uh, we get recordings from the brain. We can do local processing for a number of things. We can generate the stimulation signal based on the decision that we make at uh, the local recording. This would be uh, detecting a spike, you know, to create basically external an external link between one part of the brain or another part of the brain, or create a link that never existed before by basically uh, generating stimulation in a part of the brain based on spikes that you detected in another, another part. And uh, this is uh, the current system, you know, just to compare basically what we're doing with what other people are doing. This is uh, Neurochip 2 that's uh, used by uh, FATS Lab and uh, uh, Chet Moritz in uh, University of Washington. They use it for recording from the primates and uh, for stimulation uh, with primates, and we're working with both of these gentlemen. Uh, we're now working with Cheta at FATS for the next generation of uh, this unit to basically couple our devices with uh, Neurochip 3 to generate uh, 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 stimulation to the spine based on recordings at uh, the cortical level at the, at the brain. The second unit that you're seeing here is from Brown University. That is basically a 100-channel uh, recording unit. It doesn't have stimulation. It's wireless. It can transmit uh, 100 channels of uh, um, ECOG data, the, uh, we imagine is a system that's very similar in, in uh, capacity or in features uh, to what we are doing, except that they have multiple units that they implanted as part of the skull. And uh, the size of these units are slightly larger than ours. They are five centimeters uh, long and a little bit uh, wider. Uh, and they also have uh, different uh, uh, units for uh, generating stimulation and uh, the recording. That's basically uh, adds a wireless link between them. Uh, in, in a sense, it's a good thing. You can record and stimulate from different sites. Uh, in another, you know, adding a wireless link basically adds uh, uh, unreliability to the system uh, for some, in some purposes. And then we have, uh, this is uh, PAN-BBM. These systems all came out in 2015, all recent uh, Leon owned systems. This is basically very similar, again, in, in uh, capacity to what we're doing. It's a lot larger. It does not have wireless charging. And uh, it, is, uh, it can record and uh, stimulate uh, the, uh, the brain. Again, you know, can it's wireless. Uh, the PEM-BBM uses a wireless um, channel that's similar to what we're using. Uh, we imagine uses a wireless channel that is designed explicitly for implantable systems. We're relying on a 2.4 uh, 
gigahertz uh, channel with uh, uh, with a proprietary algorithm. So when we look at basically our system compared to other things, you know, like uh, this is where we are. It's not very clear from uh, the writing, but uh, we can record uh, 32 channels of unipolar, 16 channels of bipolar uh, signals from the brain. Uh, we can, uh, the analog to digital uh, conversion resolution is uh, 16 bits. We can do up to 30 kilo samples per channel. We're limited by the bandwidth, so we cannot do this on 32 channels. We can do this on a single channel, or we can basically reduce the sampling rate and increase the number of channels to, to provide the, uh, you know, this. The most important, we have um, a battery that's produced for us by Root JD, our partner in uh, Korea, to, and we have a rechargeable system. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Moon is going to talk about uh, our recharging system, which is ultrasonic recharging system, so I will just skip that. The size wise, we're a lot smaller, and we're a lot more integrated. We're a lot smaller. We have a three centimeter diameter, about 37 millimeter thickness for our uh, implantable device. Uh, and according to our partners who works on primates, we have a lot more space to grow. Uh, so it looks like there is a lot more space in the brain where we can, or in the skull, where we can basically grow our circuit. We don't need to grow. And we have well-integrated peripheral uh, sensors uh, for measuring EMG or external uh, signal, other ex external signals. So they are all connected around the same wireless architecture there to enable researchers to do creative thinking. Um, this is a, a view of our system. So this is basically the system, uh, the implantable device, you know, connected to ECOG electrodes. There's uh, two sides. On this side, we have uh, four channels of stimulation. On this side, we have 32 channels of recording electrodes. Uh, this was uh, uh, the system that we tested in June with uh, recording and stimulation electrodes on different sides. Now, you know, like uh, with some feedback from our partners that are actually implanting these in, uh, in uh, primates, uh, we are con combining the stimulation and uh, recording electrodes so that we can choose basically any electrode for stimulation or recording. This should come out soon. This is the view of the system basically in a, in a, uh, a titanium case. We look at uh, the system that we deployed uh, or tested, I would say you know, like we did not really implant it to anybody yet, but it is uh, tested basically by connecting to electrodes that are implanted already to, the, uh, uh, to primates. So we have uh, four channels of stimulation on this device, uh, which we can control very, very closely. And then we have uh, 32 channels of uh, recording. Um, this is, again, another view of the system, which basically shows where our uh, intention is. Our intention is to implant it to the skull and uh, push our electrodes to the, uh, to the abdominal surface of the brain. Uh, or you know they can be connected to basically Utah electrodes or Utah rays or whatever the clinicians uh, decide to do with this, uh, the uh, size of the device is small enough to be placed on the skull and be part of the skull basically by that titanium casing. We're using an enhanced uh, shock burst. Uh, we uh, modified the 2.4 gigahertz uh, uh, channel to communicate it. As I said, we have basically multiple sensors. Uh, we're currently shipping these sensors to other research institutions for various purposes. We're, uh, giving them out for rehabilitation. People that are studying rehabilitation, we're giving them out for people studying uh, brain recordings. And uh, these devices, uh, this is one of the students in my, in my lab, never implanted anything yet, but uh, all external tests that basically are very successful. The last thing that I want to mention is, uh, since our channel is limited and the bandwidth is, uh, uh, since the bandwidth is limited, what we're doing is we're basically uh, we have quite a bit of onboard processing to do certain things. And one of these is basically compressive sensing uh, to detect the spikes and transmit only the spikes out rather than to transmit everything. That is basically one of the uh, you know, unique improvements that we have over the other researchers that are, that are working with us. So we, you know, like we have a spike detection algorithm that detects the spikes and considers the rest of it as noise and transmit only the spikes to add noise to it to be uh, used later. Uh, this is a stimulation uh, uh, channel. 
we can basically generate uh, uh, right now four channels of stimulation, 20 volts we can, uh, is what we are applying. We can generate, depending on the electrode uh, impedance, uh, we can generate 8 to uh, 20, 200 milli microamps, oh, amp, um, one microsecond minimum, and uh, you, we can generate basically a pulse train frequency of 200 hertz. Now, this is uh, some recordings that we get from uh, our June test with, uh, uh, with an animal in uh, University of Washington. Uh, the uh, circuits were connected to uh, the uh, Utah array that is already implanted in the animal, and uh, the recordings are coming from basically from this study. The uh, circuit, the, our circuit was external to the animal, did not go in there. And uh, uh, you can see basically this is uh, the signals that we generated by or uh, recorded with the stimulation. The stimulation is on, stimulation is off. And then this is, uh, shows basically the stimulation uh, signals, uh, a pulse train, and the stimulation signals. Stimulation is applied re re really when we basically detect a spike, we can apply a stimulation, uh, or we can apply stimulation on a regular basis and monitor the impact of this. But uh, one of the things that we are doing is we're basically, you know, like uh, uh, we need to eliminate the impact of stimulation because stimulation creates a considerable amount of disturbance on the channel that we are looking at. Here I will hand it to my colleague, Dr. Moon, talk about ultrasonic wireless transmission. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, as you say, uh, Yusuf is an electrical engineer, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, you might wonder why you guys are doing, you know, neuroscience or, you know, the... We are not you know, the scientists, we are engineers. So we basically talk about the device. And the device I'd like to talk about is wireless charging. And we have now a beautiful you know, brain-computer interface that we can implant and, uh, in the inside of the brain. Now, the, there are many ways to provide the power. One is uh, using the outlet that you don't want it, right? And or have a huge battery you know, in a backpack and uh, put the wire and uh, put into the brain. That will create a huge you know, the, the power source, but it will be not good because there will be the source of uh, in infection all the time. That many of the current animal studies doing that, actually. So other way is that we have a uh, rechargeable battery inside of the uh, brain and charge it and externally wirelessly. Of course, one of the techniques you can think of is that induction technique, uh, electromagnetical uh, magnetic you know, induction technique that you use almost every day for your cordless you know, toothbrush or some of the cell phone and that like Samsung Galaxy has now an you know, induction you know, type of the uh, charging. And in fact, there are quite many implantable devices that use this type of technique to you know, the charge the device. But uh, it has pros and cons, and one of the problem would be the heat. And, uh, but brain is very sensitive to the heat, and uh, you know, they don't allow more than two degrees of Celsius of you know, temperature increase, because it will damage you know, the very sensitive you know, the neuron. So uh, this is not a that good technique. And there are other techniques that you can think of is that kind of a new technology, <coughs> excuse me, magnetic resonance. And it, it gives that a uh, lot of advantage. But one of the disadvantages would be that, in fact, that uh, gives a huge interference on the, you know, the signal. So while you charge uh, the device, and you will see the huge amount of the artifact or the noise on the uh, brain signal. And as the complexity and the sensitivity of the reading the brain signal to control, for example, human body or to st stimulate you know, the nerve or a neuron of other body, and any chance of having interference or having the force signal would be detrimental. So uh, we've thought about it a lot, and is there any way to generate electricity wirelessly, somewhat safe, but also somewhat efficient? We chose the uh, ultrasound. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, ultrasound, as you see it, is pretty old technology. And, but uh, when you provide the, uh, you know, the basically the vibration 
and meaning uh, using the ultrasound energy. And when you vibrate in the piezoelectric membrane, it generates uh, electricity. So we uh, decided to use the technique because it is somewhat safe. And you know that ultrasound has been used for the moms, right? So it seems like it's safe, and there is not much lawsuit you know, about that. And also, it may not increase the temperature much. So that was our intention. Then the other one is how to miniaturize the device to put into a about you know the, the three centimeter diameter and the seven millimeter thick titanium can not only just this you know the you know ultrasound charging device but also with all the circuit that you as I just mentioned including the battery. So that was the, uh, the tremendous you know, the task for us to miniaturize, uh, miniaturize you know, the older devices. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the design that we have chosen. And using uh, the titanium case, uh, like a coin style, that put a very thin battery, and I'll talk about the story. Then the generator circuit that has the, uh, the BCI function as well as the uh, charging control. And then ultrasound or the piezoelectric and the transducer, matching layer and the cap all together in a around you know the three millimeter and uh, the seven millimeter thick uh, the titanium can. So uh, let me talk about the piezoelectric membrane, and we had a uh, the collaborative work with the ETRI in South Korea. That is one of the largest you know the lab in in South Korea. They're doing a lot of a nice work, and we worked together to fabricate uh, the uh, piezoelectric membrane and the using uh, you know the the PGT composite. And as you see it, uh, the that's the, actually the shape of it. And we tested that, and uh, the PGT13, uh, the composite element, uh, packaged it, as you see the bottom of it, and uh, turned out to be the, uh, it generated uh, the good efficiency and uh, also fit into the size of, you know, the owl the device. And we tested that uh, on uh, the animal skin. And you see that the, uh, the photo of the, you know, the doing the test and uh, so we checked that the, uh, the all kinds of the you know, metrics that we, we needed to evaluate the performance of the uh, charging device. And we found that it is uh, pretty much the within uh, the, our the target specification. And I'll talk about this, some of the target specification. One is the, uh, the temperature. And we found that while we are uh, charging it, uh, the, we found that the, you know, the temperature increase is about under 1.4 degree. That is the, uh, under uh, the uh, threshold of the two degree. And also the other one was that we need to have a special battery that provided uh, enough, uh, the, uh, you know, the storage capability and the uh, ampere, as well as very thin, uh, you know, the efficient, you know, the uh, battery. So we worked with uh, the, one of the, uh, the battery company who invented, uh, not invented, but, you know, they pioneered uh, the coin style in the rechargeable battery. And the company name is Root Jade. And they had a very nice uh, the patented technology that has the special encapsulation uh, of the cathode that we would need to increase the safety of the, uh, you know, the rechargeable battery because we cannot you know, the allow the, any leakage of that contents and uh, inside of the body. So they had the extra you know, the, uh, secure encapsulation technology as well as the, uh, the, the nice uh, the, uh, uh, patterning of you know the battery for us, so we finally was able to come up with the very thin battery uh, for us, and the, also we checked that what is the actually temperature increase of the battery while the discharging, and then through the many tests, and we found that is under uh, 1.3 uh, degree that is under the, our target. So this is the uh, example of the uh, titanium uh, 
deep throat you know, the, the casing that uh, house uh, the, all the battery and uh, piezoelectric membrane as well as the uh, circuit. And uh, this is the uh, picture and it shows that the uh, case and uh, the transducer uh, with a matching layer and the circuit and the battery and all together uh, and the shaped as the about you know the coin size at the module that we can ready to implant and uh, to the human body but we couldn't do it yet so we used you know on the primates all right so the the uh, test is going on uh, with uh, the Abba Fats Lab and the University of Washington, but I'd like to turn to the, the, uh, the our attention to the little bit of you know the, the wearable side of it, because implantable is the technology that we can use it, but it is very tough to commercialize it, uh, as you suggest that you know the communicating with the machine or actually used for the human it's tough to do it even getting a data is not easy because we cannot make a hole to the human brain you know the edge just experiments it doesn't work so uh, we uh, cannot wait in you know, another generation to do it so we decided to use the uh, in the wearable happen to be the device we have made it is so efficient and so small and portable it gave us uh, a very good way to use it, the brain signal to communicate with the one of the neurological uh, rehab uh, the, uh, the, uh, study. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit and I'd like to conclude you know, the, our the presentation. That one gives that the GTEC uh, commercial, uh, the six channel, the wireless, uh, the EEG. And uh, we use that uh, the device to measure uh, the concentration level. So the, as you see it, uh, you see that two uh, images, and the one is that kind of a busy one, right? The other one is a nice sunset and that you can see in the Torrey Pine Beach, right? So basically, the, what we wanted to have is that can we control instantaneous level of the concentration and the using the just looking at the image. So, so we, we did uh, from uh, the training and uh, the, uh, from fresh brain, meaning that the, you know, the subject or student never exposed to that, you know, the test, but she did once a week. So she conducted you know, the, the every week for five weeks and we collected you know, the EEG data. And it found that uh, it actually, yes, uh, the, there is a clear distinction of the, uh, the concentration uh, with the image. And we also found that the training actually enhanced you know, the difference between the, you know, the concentration and relaxation just by looking at the image. So what we are using is that also we went to some signal processing and using that you know, alpha band and the beta band and then uh, we found that you know, the, the uh, uh, alpha band and the beta band and related to the relaxation and uh, the concentration. So we uh, made the signal processing and then also we made it uh, concentration and the index. And uh, the device that we have is that it's very small device and that's wearable and our students is wearing it and it gives that instantaneous of the level of the concentration. So, and it is all wireless, and it is portable, and that communicates with the cell phone and other computer and other, and uh, the robot. So, currently what we are using uh, the device is that we are being uh, the using and uh, with the physical therapy lab in the San Diego State University. We provide the technology and uh, to the clinical site and then the clinical site, they use it for the, the, the rehab. It shows that our uh, ongoing problem of our generation of having aging, and uh, through the aging, we have a lot of the, the uh, you know, diseases. One of them is a Parkinson, as you see it, and or stroke, and you can see the many other uh, the, the diseases, and we can do uh, the rehab. So the rehab device that we have is that the approach is that why not we have a brain 
computer interface controlled uh, the you know, rehab robot and that, that use it for the, the neurological uh, the disorder rehab. So this one gives that idea of the uh, walking and the device. And also the, uh, you know, the arm, uh, the rehab, uh, the device. And then also it shows that the, uh, the one of the, our the, uh, faculty, Dr. Sims lab, and it gives that the, uh, again, the, the, the arm rehab device, uh, device for the stroke patients. So what we do basically is that we have assumption or hypothesis that, and when we do the rehab, and uh, the human you know, therapist just use the arm or leg, repeat motion, somehow the, you know, the expect the uh, plasticity of the brain so that we can have that rehab. And the robotic rehab created that it able to move it and the arm without the aid of the uh, inhuman physical therapist. The BCI based one is that actually BCI control the uh, robot and the meaning that we add the human intention of the, uh, the patients in the rehab process. So we see that it, it will expedite you know, the, the speed of the rehab. And the, this work uh, has been uh, you know, supported by the many grants, and one of them is uh, the NSF, uh, the ERC, and the ETRI, and the Kiat, uh, the Korean the government, and uh, also many other uh, the, the teams of the students, and the thank you.